We know that over the long haul, levels of education have been slowly creeping up. This has been difficult, simply because there are so many new kids every year to put into school, but nevertheless, this has been happening. We also know that the gender gap has been narrowing. That is, more and more girls are now in school, and we know that in particular, most kids, most young people in the region are now literate, and this is the first time that this has happened in the history of the region. This has all kinds of profound cultural and political consequences. We also know that a lot fewer children between the ages of one and birth are dying. Infant mortality rates all over the global south have been coming down. This is equally true in the Middle East and North Africa, but we also know that very sadly, tragically, there is a very large exception to this in the recent history of the Middle East, and that exception is the case of Iraq. We know that Iraqi child mortality shot back up as a result of a number of different political forces, the destruction of infrastructure in the first Gulf War, and then the sanctions regime due to the inability of Saddam and the United States to agree on anything. What this meant is that it generates what demographers call excess deaths. That is, you say, this is what was happening before. It is reasonable to project that into the future. And the difference between what probably would have happened in the absence of those political events and what actually did happen, as shown by the data, that area in there is the total number of deaths. How many dead kids is this? Quite a few. Quite a lot of excess in dead children, something that most Americans don't know, but which essentially everyone in the Arab world knows all about. We looked at a second case study about Iran, seeing that Iran, together with the People's Republic of China, has had the fastest demographic transition for any country for which we have data. We know that although there were attempts early on under the Shah to do this, this was essentially reversed in the 1980s, but then when the Iran-Iraq War ended in 1988, Iranian technocrats who were panicking about the rapid population growth persuaded the leadership to take a whole series of acts, including rural me medical health, health clinics, education for women, all the diffusion of contraceptives, all kinds of propaganda, all of which drove down the fertility rate very quickly. And we know that today Iran has a, le a level of fertility that is approximately more or less at replacement levels. We know that this huge amount of additions of people has all kinds of implications for government policy. It poses a whole series of challenges. The employment challenge is one of the most obviously political challenges that it creates. Because the region has the most rapidly growing labor force in the world, it, the economies just to keep up with the growth of additions to the labor force has to create jobs at rates that frankly are unreasonable to expect most economies in the modern world to be able to do. After all, you have to be four times as good as the American economy, eight times as good as the European economy just to do this. But this, to put it mildly, is difficult. Now, there's some data, such as it is, on global unemployment rates. And I mentioned that unemployment data are to be taken with several truckloads of salt globally. Uh, there we have all kinds of debates about them in the United States, much less in countries where, unlike the United States, you do not have an elaborate, well-funded, well-educated labor force working for the Bureau of Labor Statistics or its equivalent that conducts detailed surveys every month. They don't have that. So they have to get these numbers in other kinds of ways, and consequently, they're much more of a kind of a guess. Nevertheless, by any reasonable standard, unemployment rates are high. CIA tries to come up with some estimates. They have these kinds of things, and they are typically very high indeed. So in addition to keeping up with the labor force in yellow, you have the additional challenge of creating jobs to, kind of to reduce the unemployment rate. Now, long ago, there was an economist named Gunnar Myrdal, a Swede, who got, I believe, the second or third Nobel Prize in economics. And he got it for several things. One was a book about American race relations written in the 1940s called An American Dilemma. 
And a second was for a book called The Asian Challenge. It was about poverty in Asia. He had a famous phrase in there, unemployment is a bourgeois luxury. What does he mean? If you think about unemployment, how does this actually work in the United States? Well, people are, are unemployed, and that means that they're in the labor force but looking for work, and they can't find work. What happens? Well, what happens is that they find other ways to survive, other ways to get food. Perhaps they get food stamps. For six months, you can get unemployment insurance. Maybe you have to rely on other people, but mostly there is a social system run by the government of a kind of unemployment insurance system. Every advanced industrial country has a system of this sort. Hardly any global southern country has anything like this. So if you're actually unemployed, it means that you have the luxury of waiting for a job to open up. Typically, this means in the Global South that your family or some set of extended family connections are feeding you, housing you, clothing you, helping you survive while it goes on. So this is another reason why people think there are a lot of reasons to wonder about this. And often there is a category that economists in, de in development studies use called the informal sector, meaning basically jobs like selling shoes on the street, selling homes, wiping off people's windshields in the middle of traffic, selling roses on the street, all kinds of things that are, do not, are not typically captured in the official statistics. These are the kinds of jobs that people probably would rather not have, but they do it because they don't have an alternative. And so that, too, is another dimension of the nature of the employment challenge. Most of those people, although they have jobs, although they are employed, clearly have jobs that they would rather do something else. So that, again, increases the challenge on the state, which, as we'll see for various historical reasons, is are the folks that people look to to do this, right, uh, to create jobs. Now, oil can help. Oil rents help you a lot. Another reason why governments want oil revenues to be flush is that in this period, remember when oil prices started going back up, notice what happened to the unemployment rates. Unemployment rates went down right, because governments had more money to spend. And so you can see an additional motivation why governments believe that oil rents substantial oil rents and therefore relatively high oil prices are necessary for political stability inside their countries. Right? This is part of the logic. In this particular slide from the World Bank, it says that employment actually in this period grew faster than the labor force. So they were able to keep up with the number of, of new entrants. This is being helped by slowdown in the growth of the labor force, thanks to demographic change. But they were only able to do this because of this big surge in oil rents. And the picture's a little murkier, because in fact, in some of the oil exporting countries, this didn't happen. At the pre previous slide is a composite slide of multiple countries' experience. So it remains fairly complicated. But it does look as if employment growth in the Middle East and North Africa in this period was very high. Of course, if you are an era of a country, maybe not a state, but a group of people who regard themselves as a nation, like the Palestinians, then something else altogether is going on in terms of very high unemployment rates. A last feature that matters for the nature of governance in this region <coughs> about all of this is that the government has been, for reasons we will discuss today historically, the employer not only of last resort, but often the employer of first resort. Not only do people feel that governments are responsible for the economy as a whole, which after all is something that we as a view we share in the United States, but additionally, the good jobs have historically been government jobs. They're secure, they may be a bit boring, <coughs> But they're secure, they pay a, a certain amount of money, not very well, but they guarantee a certain level uh, of, of money. So, there is a literature in political science that tries to associate these youth bulges generated by demography with political instability. There's a lot of debate about this. It's a big literature. You can go look into it. 
Here's youth as percentages of adults, and sure enough, what you find is very high percentages of youth as percentage of the total population in the Middle East and in Africa, regions in which, yes, there is a lot of political instability. Now, of course, we have the old problem. Yeah, correlations do not prove causation. And another thing to remember about the Middle East is if you, uh, an implication of these declining fertility rates and decelerating population growth rates is that the youth bulge, while very large now, is likely to diminish in the near and medium term. So that means the CIA tracks this here, saying, well, look, I mean, these are the countries right now having a youth bulge, but they won't anymore. They think by 2015. Some people think this is excessively optimistic, but nevertheless, there is this view. So to the extent that you think youth bulges are part of the source of political instability, it is possible that demography all by itself will reduce the levels of political instability in the near, in the medium run, let's say. This, again, is... I seems to me, suggests that an appropriate strategy for countries outside of the region that are concerned with developments in the region would be patience and a kind of Hippocratic oath of doing no harm. Something, alas, of course, that we have ignored. There's an assessment of some political scientists trying to come up with this kind of notion. Here's a, a man I know named Tarek Youssef who was an economist at Georgetown for quite a while and now went off to make big bucks in the Gulf, uh, says, well, youth bulges lead to an expansion of education. There's a lack of employment opportunities. And when you combine with the independent variable of limited political participation, you get a lot of very annoyed youth. And lots of angry young men is not necessarily good for you so uh, politically, and this then gives rise to domestic conflict. What he leaves out is that this expansion of education by itself creates a potential source of destabilization because now people are literate, this increases the ability of people to exchange political ideas, and lots of things come from this. So, great transformation in terms of population growth, employment challenges, youth bulges, all of these things are, as we already know from the case in Europe, the great transformation is inherently politically destabilizing. It's also destabilizing for a second reason, because of urbanization. The region urbanized very rapidly in the last generation. Historically, the Middle East was rather more urban than other parts of the world, simply because of lack of rainfall, and so the agricultural sectors were relatively smaller relative to the rest of the economy. It's actually slowing down now simply because if you get to very high levels of urbanization, well, then there aren't very many more people who can move to the cities. And there are a number of mega cities. Cairo, where I lived for two years, is a big one, 15 million. And this is just a notional guess. Nobody really knows. It's a little bit like Southern California, where, you know, what's the boundary between LA and Orange County and Orange County and San Diego? Well, there's a kind of an idea, but really it's one continuous kind of megalopolis. Same thing is true in Tehran with another 15 million and Baghdad with well over 7 million today. These are very, very large cities by any standards. Uh, these are cities as big as Los Angeles, New York, uh, and uh, Chicago. Rural population has been going down, and this shows the increase in urban residents. Notice this big jump in here, a period that is going to be of great interest to us, and then again projected to increase further, not so much because rural people move to the cities, but simply because of population growth in the cities themselves. The Middle East and North Africa, next to Latin America, is the most urbanized region of the global south. It's much more urbanized than East Asia and certainly far more urbanized than Sub-Saharan Africa. It's interesting to look here at the percentage of population living in cities. Notice, Americans have an image of Saudi Arabia as being people who are Bedouins, that is to say nomads. But in fact, Saudi Arabia is more urbanized than the United States. Okay? So this is just illustrates, once again, they're all, you know, nothing new under the sun except the history that we don't know. There are all kinds of things that we think are true that actually aren't. These countries are as urbanized as Italy, okay, and so forth as we go along. 
As I say, urban growth has been decelerating simply because more and more people live. I mean, once you get up to these kinds of levels of 80 to 90 percent, it's clear that that's not going to change very much. Oh, one explanation here about Egypt. This is a footnote. Egyptian data have a very, the Egyptian national statistics have, an, have a very idiosyncratic definition of a city. It's a purely political definition. And rather than what's used usually is urban agglomerations of over 8,000 or 10,000 people, they use something else. If you use the UN categories, you come up with urbanization of around 80%. <coughs> there is a concept advanced by a very brilliant man named Mike Davis called Planet of Slums. It works like this. The great transformation in Europe and in Japan, and to some extent, although it's a little more mixed in East Asia, was accompanied by rapid industrialization, rapid industrial growth, and therefore the creation of a large number of industrial jobs. But in the Global South, in places like Africa or places like the Middle East, although some industrial <coughs> jobs were created, many fewer are being created. There has long been a debate amongst economic demographers about why people move from rural areas to the city. Are they being pushed out of the countryside? Or are they being pulled by the cities? Or the usual economic notion, which is it's really driven by wage differentials. Uh, that that's really what it is. That you, they, you, you look at the wage, the real wage, <coughs> where you come from, and the real wage of where you want to go. And if that's a gap, then you move. Data all over the world is consistent with this, and this, again, as a footnote, if you want a single economic statistic that will show you why opponents of immigration from Latin America into the United States are economic idiots, this is the best one. As a, as a ballpark rule, real wages in the United States are 10 times real wage, the real wage in Mexico. This creates a gigantic incentive for any rational actor, as posited by economic theory, to move to the United States. This is not likely to go away anytime soon, and politicians are simply posturing uh, when they say that this somehow can be fundamentally changed. And that, 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 that. End of rant. In the Middle East, in North Africa, about a third of all urban dwellers live in something that the United Nations is willing to call a slum. If you want to pursue this first further, here's a guy, Mike Davis. There's his book, Planet of Slums. It has a lot of really interesting stories and anecdotes and data, really well worth reading. Now, what do these slums look like? Well, here's Cairo. And Cairo has gigantic areas uh, that are like this. When I was a younger man going to Cairo a lot in the late 1970s and early 1980s, you could walk all over these places, and I did. I walked all over these, these kinds of areas. They were very densely populated, uh, and this is one example. If you think of another slum called Sadr City, which is in Baghdad, in eight square miles, there are about two million people, as a guess. Founded in 1963, it was called Revolution City by the regime in Iraq at the time. It attracted very poor immigrants from the south who were practicers of the Shia version of Islam. It, from the beginning, was a stronghold of political opponents of the government uh, just down the street uh, in Baghdad, the Iraqi Communist Party, uh, which led resistance to a coup by the Ba'athists, the origins of Saddam. Uh, in 1963, were headquartered to here. <coughs> Later, the Islamists of a Shi'i sort are there. Today, Muqtada al-Sadr and the Jaysh al-Mahdi, the, ar the army of the Mahdi, uh, have as their stronghold uh, Sadr City. So these places, and this is what Sadr City looks like in the dust, in the exhaust, in the heat, these are the kinds of places where people can get organized, where, and as we'll see, governments all too often are basically absent or unable to, ex to extend various kinds of basic services, so somebody else does it, and those somebody else tend to be political activists. In Turkey, they have a very colorful word, gecekondu, which means sprung up overnight, about squatter settlements. This is a squatter settlement on the outskirts of the capital of Ankara, where people build, and one thing that happens in these settlements is that at first people may build them out of very flimsy materials. But if you let these people have property rights in their house, they start improving it. First, they say, well, now we're going to make 
we'll stop using tin cans and instead we'll use cinder blocks and then we get a better house and they do better and then you get a little more and then they try to get electricity and so on and so there is this process. A very colorful slum in Cairo is called the City of the Dead. You see here over on the right, this is a tomb dating from probably the 13th or 14th century of a group of people called Mamluks. They were actually slave warriors, largely from Central Asia and the Caucasus, who ruled Egypt for hundreds of years and who then had tombs built up in the outskirts. As squatters moved into the city from the countryside, they moved in to this vast open air cemetery and began to build homes around, like here, right next to the, to, to the tombs built all over the place. Another colorful name is from North Africa, Bidonville, which means Tin Can City. And the Tin Cans, the origin of the name comes from discarded oil cans of United States troops fighting in North Africa in World War II. So oil has all kinds of interesting uh, implications for the region. This is in Rabat uh, in Morocco. What are we talking? Maybe a third? But in some places, it's considerably higher. Like in Iraq, it's well over half of everybody who lives in cities lives in slum conditions. In a place like Yemen, it's nearly two-thirds. So, what are we talking about here? Very large numbers of newly educated young people who have the first time some education, who are living in slums, who cannot get jobs that are satisfying to them, and who are reflecting now and have some educational tools to allow them to reflect on whether or not what their governments are doing is a good thing or not. And they very typically come up with an answer, we think not. We think actually, Mr. Minister, to be really honest, we think you suck. We really don't like you at all. We really think this is bad. And this is a major source of political instability in the region. Last thing to note is questions of poverty. <clears throat> poverty, as a word, as a concept, has a whole bunch of issues about definition. Not going to go into those now, but there are also many data issues. The conventional wisdom, for example, from the World Bank, which is not entirely wrong, is that the Middle East and North Africa tend not to have poverty that is quite as serious as other regions of the global south, in the sense that People in the Middle East do not typically starve outright. There are elaborate systems of social solidarity that ultimately can be traced to Islam, but that also are backed up by governments, or at least governments attempt to back them up, that prevent people from <coughs> falling down to the lowest imaginable levels of degradation that you sometimes see, for example, in South Asia. This, of course, is disputed. And there are all kinds of political aspects about these data. What the World Bank claims, if you use a certain concept of the poverty line, then you get a low rank for the Middle East. You don't get much change over time. And if you use different lines, like here are two different World Bank lines, then there's a national line. You get a range, for example, in Egypt all the way from 2% to 42%. So as I say, this concept is kind of elastic uh, and somewhat difficult. It is true that statistically speaking, as this slide shows, global hunger is not so much a Middle Eastern problem. And this, again, is the result of so the social solidarity of the society and in particular of the governments. But that puts a burden on governments and additional budgetary burden is placed on the, gov on the governments. So. <coughs> From this, we conclude this. There is generated just by the great transformation <coughs> itself, all alone, without foreigners, without anything else, we would have political and social crises in this region. Simply because of this phenomenon of population growth, the youth bulge, urbanization, education for the first time, in a context in which it's very difficult to create enough jobs, it's difficult to create enough housing, it's difficult for young people to get the resources together so that they can marry and have <coughs> families. All of these things generate enormous social frustrations. And in addition to this, many people in the region, many young people in particular, re regard their regimes as corrupt, not only domestically, but also in their foreign policies. So that's the challenge.
let's talk about how governments have coped with this challenge. To do this, we have to do some history of political economy. We're going to have to think about, okay, so governments, we're going to have to try to launch, to develop, that is, to increase the number of jobs, to industrialize. How are they going to do this? What challenges were posed to them? And what kinds of strategies were available? And we need to talk about this by going through some history. In the first place, development ever since the British were the first to industrialize, ever for everyone else, development was an imperative. And we've already seen some of this. If for no other reason it was an imperative for reasons of nationalism, why would the, the German state contribute to the industrialization of Germany? Because they felt the German state had been walked all over by Napoleon and therefore they weren't going to let that happen again. Why was the Russian state so concerned to industrialize? Because, as Stalin famously said, the Mongols stomped on us, the Teutonic Knights stomped on us, Napoleon stomped on us, Hitler is trying to stomp on us, and we are not going to let this happen to us ever again. So over and over again, you can see this. You can see this in the, throughout East Asia as well, and it is just as true in the Middle East and North Africa. Development was an imperative for these states. But to do this, you need savings. You can't simply industrialize without investment, which means you need to get savings from somewhere because you need funds for investment. And if the state is going to do this, you need tax revenue. We already know this from Charles Tilley. You need tax revenue for the state to build up the military, to invest in education, to create human capital formation, and above all, of course, you need to do all these things, plus you need to have police, you need to have informers, you need to have a military, because you need to stay in power. And we know that this is the kind of model of the rentier state, of a state that gets its income exclusively, largely from oil rents, and that's kind of where it goes. Now, where to get this money? Let's first just consider this in general, because after all, remember, the industrialization of this region precedes large-scale oil rents accruing to the nation-states. Right? Remember that most nation-states didn't get very many oil rents until after World War II when the 50-50 arrangement was set up. And even then, a number of states weren't getting a, a, a lot of it. And Iran had those, all those problems. So it's really not until the 1970s that you really get large-scale oil rents. So what were they thinking before this? And because they had to think and face certain constraints, they therefore had to embrace certain kinds of strategies. These have consequences, and we want to talk about it. So what are your choices? If you want to get this money, where are you going to get it? Well, one possibility is you can get it from foreigners. Maybe you get people who are willing to invest in your, in, in your economy directly, and maybe you do. Maybe you get people from Europe in the Middle East. Maybe you get other outsiders, as you conceive it, who are willing to do this. But this raises a lot of political problems, particularly for nationalists. Well, then, suppose you say we're going to get it from nationals, however we define nationals. Maybe these are private people, okay, but then how do we tax them? And who are they anyway? And if they're relatively rich people, we may have a couple of problems. The first is the economic problem. David Ricardo, writing in the early 19th century, thought that he, he, he despised English landlords. He hated landlords. Why did he hate landlords? He hated landlords because he thought that, in his mind, there were basically three classes in England. There were landlords, there were capitalists, entrepreneurs, and then there were the workers. And he said, look, you know, the workers are doing the work, and the capitalists are making the investments, and they're the creative. But the landlords, they just take these rents, and they burn them up in fancy parties. Right? They're just lavish spenders. Now, historically, actually, we know that's actually not true with the English landlords, but never mind. There is this conception that the rich would do this, and in some parts of the world, like Latin America, there's much truth to it. The Argentine rich, for example, would send all their kids to England to expensive education. So this is money that they get that then doesn't get reinvested in, in that particular society. And consequently, there was that problem. 
It's also a political problem in that any given regime may not like these landlords. Maybe these landlords are your political enemies, and so it's an issue. This is this issue of class and ethnic group come together in the Middle East. Before the era of nationalism, and as a result of <coughs> imperialism and just developments in the region in the 19th and early 20th century, this is kind of what the distribution of wealth, conceived of as a pyramid by the late great economic historian Charles Isawi, shows that in North Africa, of course, which was directly colonized, Europeans were at the top. But notice that in these other three places, Turkey meaning the Ottoman Empire, you had sort of folks, Jews, Armenians, Greeks, Europeans, scattered along in here, and Muslim Turks were sort of at the very apex, but there were these folks. So are you going to tax these folks? Well, if they're Greeks and you're a, a Turkish nationalist, maybe not. And so there was this kind of set of issues, as we'll see, that came together around this particular problem of how to get investable resources initially. Now, economic development types, uh, people who do economic development e economics, have come up with a kind of set of strategies. That is, if you want to go out and generate revenues that you need, and this also very much means foreign exchange. You not only have to have savings, but you have to have savings and you have to get your hands on the ability to buy things from foreigners. Why? Simple. If you want to industrialize and you're not industrialized now, at a minimum it means you've got to buy the machinery from foreigners. Right? You can't make the machines yourself, so you've got to buy them. So how do you get the money to do this? You've got to have money that those folks will take. And this means you have to have foreign exchange. One strategy that they talk about as well. Maybe you have a lot of agricultural goods. Maybe you've got some agricultural surplus, and maybe somehow you can mobilize this and export it, and this is the way to get it. And in fact, this was certainly what most countries in the global south did until the 1930s. Then there is something that we need to spend a fair amount of time on called in the literature import substituting industrialization. This idea, and we'll talk a little more about in a bit, is the notion that, look, if all we do is sell food or cotton or cocoa or something abroad, and then we get money back, and then we buy the machines, and then those, you know, so how do we do this? How can we then, we buy the machines to, let's say, set up a bottling plant to make soft drinks? Or we buy them to make uh, a plant to make textiles, to make simple clothing. But how can we expect our manufacturers who are new to this business to be able to compete with international companies in the textile business or in the soft drink business? How can we do this? Answer, it was given, we can't. So what we have to do is keep out their imports and we try to substitute for those imports. We industrialize by replacing foreign imports with locally manufactured goods. Third idea, of course, is, well, something else you can sell, and that's oil. And we'll talk about that and its implications. And last, a strategy that emerged in around the late 50s, early 1960s in East Asia was a strategy of exporting certain kinds of manufactured goods. It was really pioneered by the Japanese in the 19, late 40s and 50s. And there is another last question that is crucial to ask, and that is whether or not economic development specialists are making any sense when they talk about these as strategies, implying that there is actually a choice, whereas in fact they may much more closely resemble historical sequences, which, as we'll see, certainly seems at least going from one to two to three to four, for example, is very much the history of large parts of the developing world. But for the time being, even if there are sequences historically, the story really begins up here with number one. So we've got to talk about this. This happened. I don't have time in this class to go into a lot of details about how and where and how it happened, but it did. But it therefore had a number of problems for newly independent regimes. First, it was linked in the minds of elites and also in actual practice to colonialism. 
Second, as I've mentioned, there were these ethnic and nationalist issues about maybe a lot of the financiers doing this, let's say in Turkey were Armenians, and maybe you really don't like the Armenians if you're an ethnic Turkish nationalist, and so on and so forth. So there are issues there. Then there's last an economic question about terms of trade. Okay? Now, terms of trade, very briefly. What this means is, sure, remember this idea. We sell agricultural goods abroad, and we buy machinery from abroad, or maybe we sell agricultural goods and we buy manufactured goods like clothes and soft drinks and whatever from abroad. <coughs> but the question then is, yeah, but what's happening over time to the price of the things we sell, agricultural goods? compared to what's happening over time to the price of the industrial goods we have to buy. Now, it's pretty simple economics to recognize that typically the demand function for agricultural goods is price inelastic, which means it slopes down steeply. So if more and more folks are selling, you would expect the price of agricultural goods, other things being equal, to fall particularly in, since we don't care just about the absolute price, but the price of those agricultural goods which we sell relative to the price of the industrial goods which we buy. And there's lots of evidence that suggests that by contrast with ag goods, manufactured goods, price elasticity is much, it is much flatter. It's much less price inelastic. It's much more elastic. So you can sell more of these things. Bottom line, over time, Based on this simple model, you would expect that to sell agricultural goods, to buy industrial goods, you have to run faster and faster simply to stand still. Because the price of the stuff you're selling relative to the price of the stuff you're buying is going down. And so you have to, and this looked like a loser. So this is basically the terms of trade argument. Not surprisingly, it first came up in the 1930s when the price in internet, the market for international commodities collapsed and the price of all agricultural goods slumped hugely. And it was, this was certainly clear in the 1930s that this agricultural export strategy was doomed. It couldn't possibly work. Uh, the markets had basically collapsed. In this environment, a famous Argentine economist named Raul Prebisch formulated this terms of trade argument. And he said, as long as the global south, he didn't use that term, of course, but as long as the global south continues to just export agricultural goods and import manufactured goods, we're doomed. We'll never get out of this. We're caught in the, on this treadmill where we can never <coughs> escape poverty and we can never increase our relative economic status in comparison with the Europeans. Formally speaking, it says that the elasticity an elasticity argument. So you had to run f harder and harder to stand still. And that's the argument. Was the argument true? Well, unsurprisingly, 50 years after Prebisch enunciated this, I know you're shocked to learn that economists still argue about it. Here's one view that says, you know, actually, there doesn't seem to be much trend here. Maybe it's not actually true. I think, as a generalization, you could say many development economists are rather dubious about the terms of trade argument. Although, it matters a lot whether, or as you might guess, whether or not you put oil into the basket of commodities that the global south is considered to be exporting. If you put oil in, well then yes, it looks like the terms of trade improve for developing countries. Look familiar? Big increase here, big increase there. Oil prices. Suppose you take oil out. Well, maybe. Maybe Prebish had a point. People still argue about this. But of course, what really matters for our purposes is that elites in the region certainly believed it. They had some reason to believe it. Their economies, they believed, were mired in a, a treadmill of producing cheap farm goods with unskilled labor. They thought that colonialists perpetuated this situation. They thought they denying education and modern skills. And they believed that their countries had been forcibly integrated into the global division of labor. And they didn't profit very much from this. So 
bottom line for rising nationalist elites who are also in the process of trying to create a modern state at the same time is that they thought the state had to build itself, protect itself from colonialists, and industrialize simply in order to survive. So from the beginning, there is an economic development strategy that is part and parcel of the rise of both nationalism and the nationalist project of creating a modern state in the region. So they embraced import substituting industrialization. Now the basic idea, as I say, where does the word come from? It comes from this idea of substituting for imports the products of your own industry. That's why it has this strange sounding name. You're substituting for imports by producing them yourselves. This was a nationalist project and I would add, as we'll see, it has always and everywhere been a nationalist pro project, including in the United States of America. Well, this though raises an issue. Where are you going to get the money to do this? Huh? Good question, right? I mean, you don't like this selling an agricultural goods, and maybe the bottom has fallen out of those anyway. So where are you going to get the money to do this? How do you do this? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, we need it. But how to do it? Good question. You didn't, if we set oil aside for a moment, as we should in the 1930s in the region, well, you get it from agriculture. Well, how to do that? How do you get it? There are all these farmers, they're all over the place, all over all out there. How do you get your hands on it? Well, basically the idea was twofold. First, you protect your domestic market. That requires state action. You put up tariffs, or that's a price way to keep out things by putting a tax on them, that's all the tariff is, a tax on imports. Or you have quotas, a quantity restriction. You simply don't allow any more than X amount of imported stuff in your country. They're equivalent economically. And you do this to protect your so-called infant industries. So import substituting industrialization had this so-called infant industry argument. The notion that, well, we can't compete right now because we just started off doing this, so we gotta learn and therefore we gotta protect our market to do it. Okay? And so we have then another bunch of internal regulations somehow where we figure out a way to shift resources out of agriculture into industry. And this again is going to require state action. Now, historically speaking, with the possible and only possible exception of the United Kingdom, every state in the world that has industrialized has, at some point, embraced this strategy. Every single one. The Germans used state power and tariffs and regulations to build up their own economy. After the Civil War, the United States did the same thing. Indeed, one of the reasons, it wasn't the main reason, but one of the reasons there was a Civil War in the first place in the United States was that the agricultural exporting plantation slaveocracy elite in the South was opposed to any kinds of tariffs, whereas the manufactured elite in Pennsylvania, New York, and New England were very much in favor of it, and before 1860, the Southerners could block this. The moment the Southerners were out in the Civil War, while the Civil War was still going on, there was a very large-scale tariff passed by the now only Northern Congress, and so the United States did the same thing. We had among the highest levels of protection <coughs> of any country in the world in the late 19th and early 20th century. We did it too. So did the Japanese initially, so had the Chinese done it, so did the Taiwanese initially, everybody has done this. This was the dominant paradigm for economic development for an entire generation. This is what everybody thought should be done. This was the usual recommendation. All over the world it was being done. Unsurprisingly, it was also embraced in the Middle East and North Africa. It was closely associated with nationalism. Certainly it was in the United States and Germany and everywhere else. And often with socialism of some kind. And as we'll see, not always. Sometimes it was 
outright socialism of a kind of Marxian sort. Other times it was a kind of socialism as in this weird hybrid we'll talk about, Arab nationalism. Sometimes it wasn't really called this, it wasn't called socialism, it was called statism, etatism. The Turks like to use a French word to describe what they were doing. And as we'll see, sometimes, arguably the most conservative regimes on the planet, in the, that is to say, the kings and princes of oil in the Persian Gulf, did exactly the same thing. So, how did import substituting industrialization start in the Middle East? Well, you already know how you would be, where you would look to start answering that question. Because you know, first, this strategy is going to be part of a national strategy. Second, it requires an independent state. So clearly, the countries that were still colonized in North Africa, or countries like Egypt, where the British still had a lot of control over policy, or the mandates in Syria and Iraq, which were a kind of closet colonialism, you know they wouldn't be the place it would begin, and instead it begins in Turkey. So the Turks pioneered this strategy for the whole region. Turkey had shown other Muslims in the region that you could drive out Western imperialists by force of arms, and this is exactly what they did in the war of 1920-23. This war hero, Kemal Ataturk, was a reformer, and he launched a whole series of programs social reform, <coughs> educational reform, including this change of the alphabet that we talked about, and industrialization. Okay. He was admired and emulated by countries that could emulate him. He was admired more widely, but he was also emulated in countries that were dependent. The state initially tried to foster industry by encouraging private enterprise. They tried this at first. But the problem was the ethnically Turkish middle class, the ethnically Turkish entrepreneurial class, the bourgeoisie, to use European terminology, was relatively weak because the bourgeoisie had been Greek and Armenian and Jewish. And remember, Turkish nationalism is an ethnic nationalism, a pretty nasty kind of nationalism that says, no, no, we don't want those folks. We want ethnic Turks running the industry. And they're not there. We don't have such a bourgeoisie. They got tariff autonomy in 1929, which coincides with the Global Depression. It's perfect. They set up this system of statism, the French word they like to use, to try conscious industrialization. They're the first country outside of the Soviet Union to set up a series of five-year plans to try to do this. Now, let me hasten to add. Auditor was not only not a communist, he was an anti-communist. His police hunted down and shot Turkish communists for years. So this had nothing to do with embracing the ideology of the Soviet Union and everything to do with the imperatives of a nationalist state-building project under the historical conditions that they, in which they found themselves. They got a loan from the Russians because the Soviets were happy to help anybody who was trying to be a little more independent from the West, so they got a loan and they started up. Now, in some ways, Turkish industrialization resembles German industrialization, which is not very surprising. Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, had very close relationships with Imperial Germany. They fought on the same side in World War I. German military officers helped train the Ottoman army uh, in the run-up to World War I, so they had these close connections. And in Germany, there was a similar use of the state to foster industrialization under essentially politically conservative auspices. The idea was, in Germany, steal the thunder of the German left, the Social Democratic Party, set up a welfare system so that workers have a kind of floor, set up tariffs, set up quotas, have the state own the entire railroad network, have the state use the banking system to help fund private entrepreneurs, of whom there were plenty of Germans uh, available. They set up tariff walls, and this system of using cartels of banks was a very German way to do this, investing in import-substituting in industries. 
But we still, so okay, we see some of the elements. But there's one element missing. Where did they get the investment money in the first place? Where did it come from? Answer, by taxing the agricultural sector. How do you do this? In most of these places, what you do is you set up a state monopoly on the marketing of agricultural products. That then allows the state to manipulate the prices that farmers get for their crops compared with the prices they have to pay for various inputs. And the state can then use this as a way to generate savings by extracting them from the rural sector to put them into industrialization. This happened again all over the world. So the Turks led the way in doing this. Now, once other states became independent, they would do exactly the same thing. They would say to themselves, well, look at what the Turks are doing. And it was working. The Turks were building up industry. And this was adopted, for example, in India. When India became independent okay, in, their, in the late 1940s, they set about deliberately doing exactly the same thing. And by the late middle, by the, let's say 1980, essentially every single manufactured good of any kind in India was made in India. Maybe it wasn't made very efficiently. Maybe there were all kinds of issues that we'll get to. There were difficulties in this strategy. But in all cases, there were, throughout the global south, there was this campaign, protect yourself from the outside, build up your domestic industry. Okay. And do this by extracting resources from agriculture and notice throughout a very strong role for the state in doing this. So that's the Turkish paradigm. Then it gets replicated. It gets done a number of other places. big one is Egypt under Nasser. Why do we care? We care about Egypt because, basically, one out of three so-called Arabs, remember the whole issue about what that means, means these days, a speaker of, Arab, of the Arabic language of some dialect or another, about a third of all Arabs are Egyptians. So Egypt has always been a key Arab country. Its behavior has all kinds of implications for behavior elsewhere in the region. Now, this man, Kamal Abdel Nasser, we've seen him before in talking about the history of the international state system, he was an, an, an Arab nationalist and an anti-imperialist. What's an Arab nationalist? Well, a nationalist of an ethnic sort, but also a guy who thinks there should be something called Arab socialism. He also was not exactly a communist. He too, like Ataturk, hunted down, imprisoned, and executed all kinds of Egyptian communists and other leftists, and right-wing uh, right Islamists as well. But this was his idea. The first thing that his government did was to launch a land reform program. This was hugely popular. Why? Because as a result of the way Egypt was integrated into the international economy in the 19th century, there had sprung up a landlord class that looked very similar to David Ricardo's landlords. Many of them were Egyptians, many of them were Muslims, probably a majority of them were, but there were also large numbers of Armenians and Greeks who also owned land. And this small class of people, probably numbering something less than 5%, maybe 2% of the population, owned 40% of the agricultural land. Nasser didn't like this. He was against this. And he had a land reform program to break up these big farms with some compensation. It was the usual story. He didn't just he didn't shoot them. It wasn't like in land reforms in a communist country. He didn't just take them out and shoot them. He said, yeah, you get to give up your land, and we'll give you some money. And if you come, don't complain too much about the money you're getting. You're lucky that you're getting any money at all. And then they either leave or they do something else. Part of the idea was actually to stimulate these people to become entrepreneurs, to start to overcome the alleged David Ricardo problem. Well, if we take away their land, but they're still pretty rich, maybe they'll start investing in some small-scale industry. Maybe they'll do something more useful. This was hugely popular. There was a time in my career when I worked all over rural Egypt, and everywhere you went, 
peasants would always say, oh, well, a lot of things about Nasser maybe we don't like so much, but the land reform, oh yeah, that was really good. We got some land for the first time. This was a really good deal. But then, you, they used the land reform to set up this system that I mentioned earlier, this system of they got farmers to be in what they called cooperatives. Now, these cooperatives were not voluntary. You didn't have a choice. You had to be a member. Everybody in the village had to be a member. And how did this work? Well, in Egypt, if you are growing cotton, which is true in the northern two-thirds of the country, if you're growing cotton in the summertime when you harvest it, you're going to sell it. Who do you sell it to? You sell it to the cooperative, which is part of the government. That is to say the government was the sole purchaser of the main cash agricultural export crop. So they then could pay farmers a lower price, sell it at the international price, and pocket the difference, which they hoped they could then use to invest in things. They also had programs of manipulating taxes of prices of the things that farmers bought, like fertilizer, like farm implements, things like this, as a way to try to further tax them. And then they launched an extensive industrialization program. Nearly all of this was in so-called state-owned enterprises. And this was what then became known as, quote unquote, Arab socialism. This was what they set up. They also invested in very large infrastructure projects. The biggest one of all was the high dam at Aswan, which they did with Soviet help. Uh, and they then, so they're spending money on lots of different things. So this was the core idea. And remember, this is also the period of time when Egypt is being hit by the youth bulge. Mortality rates had been very high. Sure, fertility was high. But the population of Egypt, although growing, was growing rather slowly. Then we hit this immediate post-World War II era. Mortality rates come down. DDT starts killing off malaria mosquitoes. Other public health improvements happen. And what happens? Huge influx of youth. And the government guaranteed <coughs> a job to any university graduate. Now, I imagine that sounds pretty attractive to you today. Uh, but and that was very attractive in those days. These were not such great jobs. And there was an underlying difficulty here, as we'll see. You keep putting people into government ministries, pretty soon they don't have anything to do. And it was a common experience of those of us, I worked as an agricultural economics consultant to the government, and you would go to the Minister of Agriculture, which is a gigantic building, and he would walk down these <coughs> long, dusty hallways, and you would go by room after room after room of young men, and they were largely young men, although not all, but not exclusively, who basically were sitting there reading the newspaper because there really wasn't any work for them to really do. They'd been hired, they had a job, they had a paycheck, and that was a big deal. They didn't really have much to do. Right? Source of frustration. So you get this rapid population growth, demand for education, and notice another thing. We're getting all these demands on government revenue. We've got to have money to industrialize. We've got to have money to educate people. We've got to have money to provide jobs for all these graduates. We've got to have money to build infrastructure projects. And of course, we've got to have a lot of money to have a military because we're involved in all these wars all the time. But you can see that this becomes a recipe for government weakness because you have to have all these demands and where are you really going to get the money to do this? Right? There was a tsunami of youth coming into the state. <coughs> And as a result of this, there was, there emerged a kind of a social contract. Now this was, it's in quotes because there is no document about this. It was implicit. But the implicit contract, which was true not only in Egypt but throughout the Arab world, was something like this. There are extensive consumer subsidies. Why is it the case that these people, although there's a lot of poverty, people don't actually go hungry? Well, because the food system subsidizes. And that's another expense. Right? How do you pay for all this? Where do you get the money to do it? Okay. Well, the idea was, okay, well, wait, wait, wait. This will work because we'll get profits from these new industries 
and those will be reinvested. And notice that assumes that these new industries will generate a profit. But what if they don't? What if, for example, it's difficult for them to generate a profit because actually it's hard for them to raise prices because they're state-owned enterprises. And if they raise prices, that means that the populace pays higher prices and there are political pressures for them not to do this. So that's just one of a number of kinds of difficulties. But that was the idea. The reality was that this strategy in the sense of creating the internal profits to finance all this, it didn't actually work out. Partly for internal reasons, as I've mentioned. Not only was it difficult to raise prices, it was also difficult to shed labor force, right? If you have to hire more and more workers and wages are kind of set by the state and your prices are held down, you can see pretty quickly it's going to be hard to generate profits out of doing this. But there was more to it. This is also an economy starting from the beginning, really, <coughs> from the time NASA came in, that, that is, has all these war burdens. Okay? First, the 1956 war in Suez, and then the 1967 war. And these burdens of military spending were another sort of albatross around the neck of this import substituting industrialization program in Egypt. And last but not least, developments in the global economy also begin to undermine any state's ability to sustain this particular strategy. So that's two cases. First, the paradigm as developed by the Turkish Republic. Second, the paradigm as first implemented in the very important Arab state of Egypt. What happened, what happens if you throw oil and some reasonably serious political radicals into the mix? What you get is Algeria. Algerian independence was achieved as a result of an exceptionally brutal war. Maybe a million people out of a population of 17 million about at the time were killed. It was really, really nasty. There were some third worldists, think Che Guevara kind of ideology, of people who supported the FLN, the National Liberation Front, as they were called in the French acronym. And these people were part of the folks who took power. They didn't stay in power very long, but also, remember that triangle? The top in North Africa was entirely Europeans, settler colonialists, who, in the case of Algeria, largely originated not in France, but in Italy, Malta, and Spain, but also there were some people from southern France. And they intermarried, and they were Europeans, they were Christians, and they were thrown out or left essentially en masse after uh, the end of the Civil War. At the same time, remember, Algeria discovered oil, actually foreign oil companies discovered oil in the Sahara, and part of the independence deal was that the Algerians got independence and allowed the French companies to operate in Algerian uh, in, in Algerian oil. But this mean, meant that this is a state that has access to oil. It's dependent on oil prices, so there's a period in the 1960s when they're kind of <coughs> working things out, and to make a long story short, the radicals are purged after only a few years, and a guy named Huari Boumedien, whose picture is shown here, becomes president. He was basically a general. They take over, and when oil prices explode, they then create a very, very heavily state-dominated economy. It was an economy in which the state basically did everything, and that works out really nicely as long as oil prices are high. But you know that something happened in 1986. And in 1986, when oil prices collapse, that will put, and did put, enormous pressure on the Algerian state and society, which led ultimately to an explosion in which the society collapsed into a brutal civil war in the 1990s. So it goes up, crashes down, and things just go wild. We'll talk more about that 
on Thursday about what happened in the Algerian Civil War. So that's another case of oil and radicals. Second case of oil and radicals that we care about a great deal is what happened in Iraq. Now, both Iraq and Syria had a substantial indigenous trading, landowning, bourgeoisie. Lots of them were Muslims. Some of them weren't. Some of them were local Christians. It's a large Jewish community in Baghdad. All these people knew each other. Everybody's investing. Hmm. So there was an indigenous trading group. And the monarchy in Iraq, well, as I said, I'm going to talk about Iraq for probably about two lectures, and a little, maybe not next week, the week after. And in the case of Iraq, there is a, mo a monarchical period which coincides with first the mandate period and then the immediate post-war era. And they tried to use oil revenues to invest in infrastructure. They were very friendly with the indigenous bourgeoisie. Okay? And they tried to use these oil revenues. They said, well, that's where we're going to get the money. We're going to let the locals run industry, because they will. And we're going to get money by selling oil. And so we'll build roads, and we'll build irrigation systems, and we'll try to build electricity networks, and we'll do that kind of stuff. But then, in 1958, the monarchy will be overthrown, the king will be killed, his minister's body will be dragged in the streets, and you get something else. And you get a regime run by a man named Abdul Karim Qasim, and Qasim sets about basically copying the Egyptians. Okay? They basically, both Qasim and his enemies, the Ba'athists, who took over in 1963, basically copied Nasser at the same time that they opposed Nasser politically. So they copied his economic policies, all the while saying that he was a sellout, that he was an apostate to the cause, that he was a bad guy. And they set this up. Now, again, it's a little bit like Algeria. Notice the date. Algerian radicals take over in 1962. Iraqi radicals take over in 1958, 63. But roughly speaking, from a historical perspective, the same general era. And then they try to consolidate power. In the case of Iraq, this is a very nasty business, which leads just on the eve of the explosion of oil prices to the accession to power of this individual, Saddam Hussein. And what did he do? He set up his own system of Arab, na of Arab socialism. He nationalized the bank. <coughs> they, they, these people before Saddam took these over. Two-thirds of industrial output went into state hands. And once you get this combination of nationalization and oil prices going through the roof, you then the sky is the limit. You set up state-owned enterprises all over the country. They employed maybe half of the total non-agricultural workforce. You're coping with the youth bulge because you have all this money and because you're a nationalist and because you have a state apparatus that can do this. And boy, did he have a state apparatus that could do this. And one in four Iraqis on the state payroll, and by some estimates, maybe a quarter of the population was informing on the rest of the population. So this was a police state. It was a police state in which the government basically tried to control everything. So now we've got three examples. We've got the example of the Turks. We've got the example of Arab socialism under Nasser in Egypt. And then we've got the example of Iraq and Algeria, really four examples. And so we say, well, yeah, you see these nationalists doing it. They were nationalists in Turkey. They were nationalists in Egypt. They're nationalists in Algeria. They're nationalists in Iraq. But turns out that even conservatives do this. Even people whose ideology explicitly repudiates the ideology of nationalism, like this man, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia do very much the same thing. By many standards, it would not be unreasonable to say that these are the most conservative regimes anywhere on earth. Yet, what did they do? They got oil rents, which, in the nature of things we have seen outside of the United States, everywhere accrue directly to the state. The state then takes these revenues and spends them. And what do they do? The same thing that they did in Iraq, and the same thing that they did in Algeria. They go out and they spend them on housing, 
They spend them on infrastructure, on storage plants for the oil itself. They invest in agriculture. They build whole new cities. Jubail, a big port, didn't exist before the oil boom. It was built from scratch at the cost of several million dollars building this gigantic port. And outside of government offices, most of the labor force came from abroad. It wasn't a domestic labor force for a very simple reason. There wasn't a domestic labor force. There weren't very many people. There were some, but there weren't a lot of them, and they weren't very likely to take the kinds of jobs that were on offer. Last example, Iran under the Shahs. Again, a politically conservative regime a regime that was closely allied with the United States, starting with the second Shah, shown on the right uh, up there. His father admired Ataturk and basically tried to copy what Ataturk did, tried to set up a state industrial bank, tariff barrier. His son launched a land reform. <coughs> this land reform was rather ill-conceived in many ways, succeeded largely in making a bunch of enemies, including enemies of the clergy, uh, we'll talk about that later. But that was the idea. And before 73, he took oil money, import substituting industrialization, a division of labor between public and private sectors, and then greatly increased state dominance of the economy when the price of oil went up. By the end of the 70s, again, in a conservative place, the state is 43% of output. Military spending was 10% of GNP. The Shah was spending everything. He was, after all, America's client. He was our policeman. We would sell him anything he wanted. This was not driven by ideology. It was driven by the imperatives of state, of creating a modern state, which is one of the reasons why we bothered to take the time to go over the process of state creation in the first place. Because unless we understand that and its structures, there is no chance of making any sense out of the history and therefore out of the violence going on in this area. Oil rents are very, very useful from this perspective. And agriculture was deliberately neglected. He had all kinds of, he imagined that Iran would become the new Prussia. Now note, Delusions of grandeur that you may have seen coming out of the mouth of the current premier of Iran, Mr. Ahmadinejad. This is not the first time that an Iranian leader has said things that look a little strange. Right? This is a kind of a nationalist project. But notice, ideology had nothing to do with this whole pro program of building up the state. What happened when he was overthrown? What happened in the Islamic Republic? Answer. A, a mass mobilization revolutionary regime nationalizes most, in, most industry, pushes state control of the economy even further, and sets up a new, organ, a new institution called foundations, or Bunyad in Farsi. They set up these foundations that are basically giant holding companies, which are controlled typically by members of the Revolutionary Guards, the sort of shock troops, elite military units, and by the mullahs. There's a thing called the Foundation of the Deprived, whose assets are estimated to be something like $4 billion. This is a big deal. And this is the core of support for the existing regime uh, in the country, combined with popular support on various poor sections of the population. So it remains a state-dominated economy. So what do we learn from all this? We learn that ideology has essentially very little to do, except the ideology of nationalism, with the creation of large-scale state power in the economy. And even regimes that explicitly repudiate nationalism, which as we'll see is the case in the case of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Nationalism is regarded as a bad thing because it violates the tenets of Islam, they think. Okay? That's their view. So even ideologically, you can reject nationalism, but the logic of the development project and the logic of the necessity of state creation created very large role of the state in the economy, in the society, which means if the state doesn't deliver, people are going to notice and people are going to be hurt and people are going to be very angry with what the state has done. 
They did a lot of things throughout the region. The region is fund looks fundamentally different economically and socially from the way it looked before this import substitute industrialization was launched. But they all face similar pressures. What happened? They established industries. They established quite respectable <coughs> rates of economic growth. <coughs> they expanded the educational system. So although we talk a lot about the failures of these states, remember, these failures are relative. Consider how daunting the challenges were, the challenges of creating a modern state, the challenges of dealing with Western pressures, the challenges of coping with the youth bulge, and the challenge of trying to industrialize in the first place under the difficult conditions of latecomers to the process. In some cases, a lot of assets were redistributed, and in all cases, the state was greatly strengthened. No economic strategy is free from weaknesses. And everything runs into problems. And this was true with this. First problem. If you tax people, maybe they don't work as hard. If you tax farmers very hard and don't pay them much for one crop, but you leave another crop alone, maybe they try to shift resources. And maybe then you wind up with fewer exports because Egyptian peasants are no longer growing cotton, but instead they're growing clover during the same season, which they feed into their water buffaloes, which then generates milk, which they can sell in local markets. To get all these kinds of ways in which economic agents respond to price shifts, and this may undermine what you were trying to accomplish in the first place. Incentives for industry, we've already talked about that a little bit in terms of the difficulties of generating profits in where you can neither hire workers, no, neither fire workers, nor dictate their wages, uh, nor uh, figure out what your, your prices are going to be. All of this meant that it might be difficult for you to generate enough foreign exchange to pay for the machinery you still needed to import. Now, note this. This term, import substituting industrialization, is actually a misnomer. It's a bad name. Why? It implies that under this strategy, imports will fall. In fact, imports go up. The composition of imports changes. You're no longer importing direct goods, final consumer goods, but instead you start importing raw materials and machinery for industry, and in fact, in many cases, the total import bill, in terms of foreign exchange, actually rose. Oil shocks, very good on the way up, very bad on the way down. Means that all of them have to start borrowing money, which increases the power of lenders, who are largely in Western financial institutions. And then in 1986, the third oil shock hits as well. So you can see how this history helps us set the stage for the political dramas that then ensue. There's this whole process where they're pursuing a kind of nationalist economic development project. It gets into increasing difficulties, both for internal reasons and for reasons in the global economy. And this then intersects with rising domestic crises and increasing Western <coughs> pressures, not just in the international oil business, but also in the whole process of economic policy and in terms of lending agents and the like. What happened among the oil exporters themselves? You have this phenomenon that I've mentioned of what I call monarchical socialism. Seems like it's deliberately designed to be an oxymoron. That's the idea, uh, but it sums up what they're doing. There is a phenomenon that took place in the first oil boom and subsequently as well, that has major social and political implications, which is migration of workers to the Gulf to work. We need to talk about that briefly. There is a phenomenon that you need to be aware of called the Dutch disease that is a macroeconomic phenomenon that reduces the ability of oil exporters to create jobs in industry and agriculture. And then there's this authoritarian social contract which basically says the state supplies education, it supplies jobs, it dominates the economy, and that's what all of you folks get. And what is the other side of the contract? 
you keep your mouth shut about how we govern these kids. Okay? It's that kind of authoritarian social contract, which notice is underpinned for, an, for at least 15 years by high and rising oil prices. But when those oil prices switch, more pressure on that social contract emerges. First, let's talk about the Higra il Naft, the migration to the oil, as they called it in the region. One consequence of the oil boom in the 1970s, all these rents, giant rents, are flowing into the hands of kings and princes who have a tiny domestic labor force. Where do you get your workers? You get them from someplace else. In some cases, if they're highly skilled, really skilled, you know, you need engineers, you need architects, you need very fancy accountants. Maybe you get them from Europe, maybe you get them from the United States. For most of the basic work, you get them from poor countries. You get them from Egypt. You get them from Yemen. You get them from Pakistan. You get them from <coughs> India. Okay? And thus, you import a big chunk of your labor force. There was a slowdown in the 1980s, but only relatively. And then along comes the first Gulf War, in which the governments of two of these countries of large-scale labor emigration to the Gulf, Jordan and Yemen, either sided with or failed to oppose Saddam Hussein to the satisfaction of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Kuwaitis, and the other Gulf princes, and so they expelled large numbers of these workers who went home for a while. It was a big trauma. All kinds of people lost their money, lost their savings. Since then, there's been a kind of a revival. Now, just as in the United States, there is endless prattling by moron politicians about how we will stop immigration from countries that have dramatically lower real wages than we do, and elementary economics tells you this is nonsense, it isn't going to happen. The same thing is true in the Gulf. There has always been this rhetoric, worked briefly for the UN on some of this stuff, and the so-called so Gulf Cooperation Council states shown there, the states of the Arab Gulf. We'll talk about how they need to Arabize, indigenize their labor force. And you'd say, well, you know, you can do something here. The Saudis actually have done something. Concerted effort over a period of nearly 20 years, they managed to get the total percentage of foreigners in their labor force down to one out of two. One out of two. So 50% of the, and Saudi Arabia has by far the biggest population. Notice that in other places, much less happened. In Oman, it actually went up. So again, lots of rhetoric and very little to show for it. What do the locals do? The locals work for their governments, overwhelmingly. Because nobody wants to staff their government bureaucracy with foreigners. They always are staffed with locals, so that's what the locals do. So again, close links between the society and the state, giving the state all kinds of leverage in terms of patronage and ability to buy people off. And if you have a lot of oil money, maybe you can do this and maybe you can't. This slide is from the book uh, that I wrote uh, that's on reserve, but that's a slide you could look at. It's a matrix from one UN document that tried to trace uh, the different flows of this. What did this do in does in the region can be seen in two simple slides. Countries from which the workers came, the emigration countries like Yemen, have this kind of age pyramid that's a typical population explosion global southern look. Lots and lots. The, the younger there are, the greater the percentage in the population. But what does the age pyramid look like in a country like that's receiving, importing? It looks like this. Here's the United Arab Emirates. And notice, well, population growth has come down, so in women it's a little more normal. But in men, you have this huge bulge. Why? Because these are the non-citizens, the non-locals who come in. Maybe they can bring their families. Notice they mostly can't as a deliberate matter of policy, and so they come in. So this is a phenomenon, and we'll see when we start talking about the political ideology called Islamism, that this will be a force. This labor migration will undermine the diffusion of ideologies very current in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf throughout the Arab world, and indeed throughout the whole world. Now, we need to understand something called the Dutch disease. This is a way in which 
basically getting large amounts of money from abroad can harm your economy unless you manage it very cleverly. What is it? What it's about? Basically, large inflows of scarce foreign exchange, foreign exchange meaning current hard currencies from abroad, the stuff you need to buy goods from all over the world. Pounds, euros, euros, dollars, yen, this kind of stuff. Uh, this, think of it as a scarce commodity. If you get a lot of this, this can now adversely impact agriculture and industry. It has the name has its origin in what happened to the Netherlands in the early 1970s when the Dutch began to discovered gas in the North Sea, natural gas, and they started to export it. Now the Dutch economy has always been a thoroughly internationalized economy. So you've got this little economy next to Germany, France, and England, three gigantic economies. So 50% of their output has always moved in international trade. They're thoroughly integrated in terms of trade. And all of a sudden, they discovered that these revenues coming in were causing the destruction of jobs in Holland. What was happening? And it became known as the Dutch disease. The intuition is pretty simple. Think of it this way. Any commodity that becomes less scarce, if a commodity becomes less scarce, whatever it is, this weakens people's incentives to get it. Right? It's cheaper. So you have less of an incentive to go out, there, go out and get it. How do you get this particular commodity of foreign exchange? One way you get it is by producing goods that foreigners want to buy. Like where? Like farm goods, agriculture. Like manufactured goods, industry. So large influxes of foreign exchange can weaken people's incentives to get scarce foreign exchange, which means it weakens their incentives to invest and work in agriculture and industry. Okay? That's the intuition. Now, they're both monetary side and real economy side ways of talking about this. Let's just talk about this as a sidebar. This is also kind of helpful. Remember this in teaching basic, whether it be Econ 1 and other intermediate econ classes, that a lot of people didn't, got really confused by language, and there are good reasons for this, but it's actually much simpler than you think. Remember, first, when people talk to you about exchange rates, remember that what they're talking about is a price. Prices, the things that are fundamentally determined by supply and demand, that the price of foreign exchange, the exchange rate, think of it as a price. Price of what? Whenever you talk about a price, you want to talk about a quantity. What's the quantity? What's the price? There are two <coughs> perspectives that lead to two, which are one is the inverse of the other, that lead to two different ways of talking about it, which in my experience confuses the hell out of students. But actually, it's very simple. And so let's just look at this. I mean, you can talk about the exchange rate between the dollar and the peso in two ways. You can talk about the number of dollars required to buy and get a peso. Or you can talk about the number of pesos required to get a dollar. Right? These are equivalent. At any one moment, there is some exchange rate. But one is the reciprocal of the other. So they're obviously the same thing. But they're just looked at in two different ways. There's a notion here of overvaluation, undervaluation, yak, 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 and it's this incentives effect. So let's talk about this first. Exchange rate is a price. Key question, what is it that's scarce? What's the commodity we're talking about? Answer, foreign exchange. From the point of view of a global southern country, the scarce commodity is this stuff called foreign exchange, euros, dollars, yen, that you need in order to buy the other things that you need. That's the commodity. If a scarce commodity's price is below the market clearing price, there's a shortage. That is to say, demand exceeds supply, right? And then if that's true, and for some reason that, that price isn't allowed to change, then that excess demand gets allocated through some other kind of mechanism. Simple diagram. Think of wheat. Here's wheat, quantity. Here's price, pesos per dollar. Pesos per... Pesos per pound. Here's dollars. 
Okay? Wheat, dollars, same thing. Think of them as identical. They're just commodities that people want. Then there's a price. Pesos per pound of wheat, peso per dollar, local currency per unit of the stuff that you want. Okay? So, there's this weird linguistic trick. Undervaluing the scarce commodity of foreign exchange is called for strange historical reasons that go back to the capital market in London in the 19th century. It is called, quote, overvaluing the currency. It just one is the reciprocal of the other. If you hold the price down, if you're saying that actually the number of pesos to use to buy a given dollar is less than the market clearing price, you've got excess demand for dollars in Mexico. And so you've got this excess demand, which needs to be changed around. Now you can flip this around. Here's a diagram Paul Krugman has in this debate about whether the Chinese currency is undervalued. This is just the flip side. If there's a price, Notice, again, local currency, yuan per dollar. Dollars are still the quantity. That's the scarce stuff. And then if here's, there's excess supply of dollars. And so what happens to this? It's accumulated by the, by the Central Bank of China. So it's the same thing. These terms are a historical artifact. One is just the reciprocal of the other. These two statements, the exchange rate is overvalued, or the price of foreign exchange is too low, are the same statement. Why do we talk like this? Second statement is the economic intuition I've been outlining for you. Think of a state in the global south that needs to get foreign exchange because they need this to buy stuff. Right? It's a quantity. It's a commodity. They need it. Any commodity has a price. Egyptian pounds per dollar or Turkish lira per euro, okay? Well, the scarce commodity is the euro, is the dollar, or the yen, or whatever it happens to be. The first statement comes up because as opposed to talking about how many pesos it takes to buy a dollar, the reciprocal says how many dollars does it take to buy a peso? Or how many British pounds does it take to buy this currency? Or does it take to buy that currency? And if you're a British investor sitting in England, sitting in London, which is, was the center of the international capital market in the 19th century, which is when these terms originated, you're interested in that other way of thinking about it, and hence you get this notion. So bottom line, this is just a sidebar so you don't get all confused in these discussions about overvalued currency, undervalued currency, foreign exchange being scarce, foreign exchange being not. There's, it's, the, the economics is actually quite simple, but it's important to understand. Well, so what? So what if foreign exchange is suddenly becomes much less scarce, so you have many fewer incentives to get it? What happens is this, the Dutch disease. You divide the world of the economy into traded goods, tradables and non-tradables, services of all sorts. You can buy anything on the international economy. Your demand has no impact on the price. And thus, resources move away from the production of things where you're likely to get traded goods. And instead, all this new foreign exchange you use to buy, let's say, traded goods, but you also use to buy non-traded goods. And you increase the price of services inside this economy relative to the price of traded goods. So naturally, people shift their allocations of labor and capital away from traded goods like agriculture, like industry, towards services. This phenomenon of the large inflows of foreign exchange leading to this effect thought of in this last diagram in a real economy model, or you can think of it if you prefer in the monetary kind of model using the exchange rate. This then leads to the reallocation of capital and labor in a way that undermines the productive sectors of agriculture and industry. This phenomenon is called the Dutch disease. Okay? And note, it doesn't matter where that foreign exchange inflow comes from. It could come from the rents of oil. It could come from a sudden large infusion of money from foreigners. Say, foreign aid has 
then Western forces move into Afghanistan and start spreading large amounts of money. So you can see this has lots of implications of the way in which this inflows will affect things. Well, <coughs> then, as we've already talked about, there is this accumulation of problems. Economic contradictions of import substituting industrialization. Dutch disease, oil price collapse, political upheavals we'll talk about later. Huge upsurge in youth, we get a large-scale social crisis. Oil crunch reduces investment. Economic growth slows down. And this social contract, which says, the state says, we provide jobs, education, you shut up. But then this becomes a problem when the oil rents begin to fall and the state can no longer uphold its share of the bargain. So, we'll see in a labor exporting state it's a little more complicated uh, as these oil revenues did get back to the countries that sent out labor, but they didn't come back via the state. Take Yemen. One study by Kieran Chowdhury, political scientist at Berkeley, showed that in fact, the way the money, the Yemenis go work in Saudi Arabia, they make money, but they save a lot of money, and they send it home. And so there's this money coming back into Yemen as a result of workers' remittances. But in this case, this money is not going directly into the hands of the state. It's going through banking channels, through private sector actors. And in particular, in many cases, it was moving through Islamic banks, who, as it turns out, will be closely connected with the political movement called Islamism. And so again, we're tracing these connections and ways in which this whole economic development and state formation process interacts with social, the social crisis uh, that is the fruit of the great transformation in the region. Now the last thing to say about oil, of course, is that it is the Midas touch. It also leads to considerable corruption. And there's this last phenomenon called the Golfeo. That's just an Egyptian colloquial word, Gulfism. That people, Egyptians who would go off, they were often rural men, would go work in Egypt, and then they would emulate the more conservative social mores of the Saudis when they came back to Egypt. And so there was the Gulfization process that took place. Now, there is a spider's web here, right? I mean, oil corrupts. We know this. Here's Senator Ted Stevens, member of the U.S. Senate. Since 1968, widely viewed as one of the most powerful of all Republican senators. He's still there. Although he was convicted on seven counts of perjury in federal court because he was taking bribes from oil. So, if it can happen to Republican senators from Alaska, you can imagine that it happens pretty widespread in the Gulf. We know that corruption is everywhere. If you look at Angola and oil production, it goes down. Here's Angola. $4 billion disappearing. <coughs> That's a good example. We'll talk more about this next time. Uh, and so I'll, we'll, we'll continue this discussion on Thursday. By the way, the second prompt is up. Uh, it's on the res. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. The second prompt is up. That's due uh, a week from, thir from Thursday. Oh, yeah. Just like I did on Tuesday. I mean, Thursday. Thank you.